Today, podcast is the first roundtable discussion of many. The goal of this format is to look at one topic in a holistic viewpoint. When working with athletes, you're most likely working with a team of coaches. So understanding this is paramount to creating a successful program. Today, we'll be discussing how maturation affects the technical, physical, and psychological components in youth football. We have Graham Mills filling the technical role, David Johnson filling the physical, and Dr. Sean Cummins filling the psychosocial. All guests come with a wealth of knowledge in this area. It was a pleasure to film this episode, so I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hello and welcome to the show. Um, so the first question we're going to is going to be the key differences between early and late maturers. So we'll start off with Graham and what you think the key difference is from the technical side from the early and late maturers. Um, so in terms of the technical side, I think with earlier maturers sometimes uh, they can you know, form some uh, bad habits because of their physical maturation can perhaps allow them to in 1v1 duels or allow, enable them to use their physical dominance or their advantages over their opponents um, in terms of the later maturers they might not have the platform to be able to be successful so a wide player who likes to get in 1v1s and be positive and take his direct opponent on may not be able to get a lot of success with that if they don't have the physical uh, capability to be able to do that. Um, so I think from a technical perspective, when players are playing in their uh, chronological age groups, the difference in maturation status can enable some players to have a lot of success and some players to be unsuccessful. But what we might be viewing there is performance as opposed to what we believe might be the potential. Um, so from a technical perspective, I guess the, the when you remove the physical challenge um, through perhaps things that we might discuss, uh, we can then start to really put a lens on potential. But from a from performance, yeah, it, depending on their growth and maturation status, um, the technical ability might look successful for one player today and unsuccessful for another. We might not be looking at the right thing. Yeah, I think with the sort of the relying on that one skill in rugby, you see a lot of uh, really fast players that can't catch. It's because once they get the ball or can't pass, because once they get the ball, they just have to rely on running. Now, the younger ages or the bigger players can just run through people, run around people. So that, I think that does translate quite well. And then, David, do you want to jump in on the strength? Yeah, part? I think um, Millsy really well described there the sort of technical differences. But so there's a few different physical changes that happen during adolescence that sort of underpin what Graham's speaking about there. So essentially during adolescence, uh, boys in particular have this period of increased growth, but also increased development in terms of muscle mass and strength. And this sort of underpins a lot of physical skills. So um, such as power in terms of jump testing, uh, sprint speeds, um, change of direction testing, and those sort of things. And this then allows certain players to develop these physical qualities earlier than other players. And obviously growth and maturation is then having an effect on the in-game stuff that Graham was speaking about. And I think that that, that overlap between physical elements and technical elements is really blurred. So for the example that Millsy gave was a 1v1, where if you're stronger, it gives you a better sort of base to then be able to show that you're good at a 1v1. You can hold the opposition player off while still maintaining control of the ball. Your ball control might not necessarily be better than a, a late maturing player, but actually the fact that you're stronger means that they don't have a chance of winning that ball back. Um, another really interesting way that strength could potentially affect um, football performance and potentially what we see as those in-game differences between early and late maturers is um, lower limb strength being related to how players can kick a ball. Um, so there is some um, sort of initial findings coming out from my work with Ben Bradley and Sean Cumming that has looked at different technical match outputs and we found that um, early maturers tend to be able to kick the ball longer and have more success in terms of their long passing but they also have more shots and score more goals, which to me relates to the fact that they know that they can kick the ball hard enough from a certain distance to have a good attempt on a goal. Whereas an early, uh, sorry, a late mature 
might think I need to get closer to the goal before I shoot because it's there's no point me kicking it from here because I won't be able to reach the goal or put it into the top corner or um, trouble the goalkeeper enough with the power of my strike, um, which I think is a really interesting element. And then I guess all of those things also relate to the sort of um, more of the cognitive and psychological skills that players can develop. But I think Sean Cummings probably in a better space to tell you about those differences. No, that's great. And then Sean, do you want to follow on from that? Because again, yes, definitely. There's a really nice uh, study from uh, it's a longitudinal study from Switzerland looking at some of their elite players. It really kind of uh, sort of demonstrated this. When they looked at the late maturing players, technically, psychologically, they were well ahead of the curve. They had to possess those qualities just to stay in the system. With the early maturing boys, there were some of them who were technically psychologically gifted, but it didn't seem to be a necessity for them. They could get by upon their physicality. But for a late developer, it's an absolute essential. Now, now, some people would argue that they develop these skills because, you know, the greater challenges they experience, but it's equally likely they already possess those abilities in the first place and had to have those abilities to survive. So, yeah, we do definitely see some differences technically, psychologically between those early and late developers then when you have that selection process uh, placed upon them too. So for Sean, on them psychological differences, mm -hmm. how much do you feel they're on an, a maturity state and um, a growth factor or is it more to do with the social side as well playing into that so if we look at just normal uh males and females we tend to find that the early maturing boys have a more positive psychological well, they're bigger, they're more muscular. When we look at things such as perceptions of physical competence or sports competence, perceptions of attractiveness, they rate higher than the late developers because they have these prized attributes. With the early maturing girls, it's the complete opposite. Early maturing girls perceive themselves as less attractive, less physically fit, and less sports competent. And largely because a lot of those changes they're experiencing are not so much gains in athleticism or, or muscle mass, but fat mass at that point of time, which kind of goes counter to... Uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of Western ideals pertaining to attractiveness. And again, that may be very specific to certain cultures as well. There are other cultures which may actually prize the process of turning from a, uh, a child into an adolescent to a female is actually a positive thing. So I think culture plays an important role. Uh, with regards to our own research in football, we did studies across a number of academies and we found that those late maturing boys uh, in terms of self-regulated and adaptive learning were much stronger than the early maturing boys. Uh, and they were kind of falling in line with this underdog hypothesis that to survive, you have to develop these uh, amazing abilities in other areas, whether it be technical or psychological. Uh, That's great. That's great. And then Graham, on them two factors is how do you, as a coach, identify if a, in a one v one situation, is if, if a player is overusing their um, fist attributes, or if it is just uh, they're more confident in using these in attributes. How do you start identifying different ways to uh, coach a different player based on what they're showing you? Yeah, I think probably try and use a, a strengths-based approach and try and, and coach what they're good at. So if, if a small player doesn't have the physical prowess to, to beat a, their opponent with physical strength, they might have to think about you know ball manipulation or if they have speed, for example, it might be that they, they try and shift the ball past and then run to try and take out that physical um, sort of confrontation or it might be that they they try and beat or evade their opponent with less touches so I think you try and well what I would try and do is try and work to the player's strengths if a player is just getting success for their big then it might be that we need to try and refine some of the technical detail because at some stage th those opponents might catch up from a physical and maturation status so then what's getting them success now might not get them success when that does occur. So we need to then focus on, is it a technical deficiency that they've got? Is it a tactical deficiency of understanding when to do it and decision-making and awareness around that? Um, so I think it's really trying just to coach the individual, um, looking at what their strengths are that they possess that makes them successful now and make them as good as possible. And also trying to identify where the weaknesses may lie when maybe the, the, the growth and maturation advantage or disadvantage starts to sort of level out that's great so what screening as a technical coach do you use to identify stuff like that um well the, in terms of the screening at the club it's done by the the sports science department yeah. so they would do um, heights and weights so the campus roach method um every four weeks that they would feed data into us to tell us how the players are or track their 
growth and maturation and which players are coming into a period of high growth. Um, so we would get advised by the sports science team so we can then plan and prescribe our practice around that. So if certain players are coming towards their um, peak height velocity, then we might have to restrict the load. So lots of 1v1s, for example, for a player that's coming into that sort of high risk um, period might not be suitable for them just because of the, the high level of impact and the intensity. So we'll try and work with the sports science department to make sure that whatever our provision or technical coaching is aligned and is integrated into what they're telling us from a growth and maturation perspective. So I guess from a screening point of view, that's where we're informed. Um, I know there are different methods like mirrored method and, and bone density scanning, but I think the most common one of, that I, I know of is the Cambridge Roach and most academies would use it. I'm sure DJ at Bournemouth uses the same. Um, so yeah, as a coach, I'm informed by them and we work as a multidisciplinary department to ensure that it's not just data. Um, we're actually applying the information that they're giving us to inform our practice on the pitch. That's good. And then on David is obviously what do you use to look at peak height velocity, but what other screening do you use at this sort of development age, especially the early developers and late developers uh, in terms of power, speed, stuff like that, or do you not um, focus on that? Yeah, so we use a very similar practice to what um, Millsy was describing there. So we use the Cambridge Roche method, but also track their growth velocity over different periods throughout the season. And then um, a recent factor that we've been using based upon Nicky Romer's work is looking at lower limb growth as well. Um, the idea behind this is that overuse injuries in the lower limbs is probably more related to growth in the lower limbs rather than growth that's occurring in the torso or um, such like that. Um, which makes quite logical sense. And some of the research has suggested this might be more related to injury than just total growth. Um, in terms of other screening and other factors that we measure, um, we take, essentially we do movement screening throughout. Um, we have regular understanding of movement quality during pre, circa and post peak height velocity um, to understand if players are regressing in their movement competency but we also get coaches to feed back as part of that as well. So understanding the coach's perceptions of, oh, such and such is um, struggling completing a pass at the moment, or they, they're they struggling to dribble or they can't control the ball. And we sort of see these adolescent awkwardness impacts occurring during peak high velocity. Um, but also then alongside that, we've got our physical testing screening, like you mentioned. So um, jump heights, um, using video to me measure the quality of landings through that and then also um, speed and agility well speed and change of direction tests um, similar to the standard e triple p stuff the way we then compare those is on an individual basis both if they are doing improving in terms of themselves and their own long-term development but also comparing those to sort of biological norms that we have in our sort of um, database so this allows you to understand whether an early developer is quick in his age group or if he's actually got those physical skills of being faster than players that are matched to him biologically um, which I think is a really important aspect especially when we go back to what um, Graham was saying at the start about are they are they using those physical skills to their advantage now but they might not have those as an advantage later on so you, you could be quick now for your age group just because you've got um, the advantages of early maturation um, rather than being having those genetic qualities or those quality, movement qualities to allow you to be fast at the adult level. Um, so that's, that's a really important aspect and that sort of helps our sort of talent ID and also our long-term development of our players. That's great. And then Sean, a lot of... Uh things on psychosocial is always that kind of buzzwords and coaching we look at this sort of a development but is there any sort of screening you actually use to identify different characteristics of the development uh could you clarify exactly what you mean by that um so we all, we're looking for things like leadership um so the thing the different attributes look for as a player okay i don't yeah. want to put words where each coach looks for their individual players but mm -hmm. how do you measure that from that starting point? 
yeah, the, when we've done our stuff looking at the interaction between biology and psychology, we've generally focused upon those attributes which have been shown to be the most predictive in terms of uh, identifying those players who are more likely to go through the systems. And as I mentioned earlier, the self-regulation or the adaptive learning was one of the key things that came through in the uh, Dutch studies. I think it was one of the key psychological predictors in terms of predicting advancement through the programme, but also differentiating between club level and international players. So in the research that we've done, we've used the sort of, uh, uh, self-regulation questionnaires that have come out of uh, the Netherlands from uh, Maria Elfling Gemser's work. Uh, but in terms of using them in an applied setting, I, I really I really wouldn't know what the sports psychologists are using uh, within the academies. Uh, David and Graham might have a better insight as to that. No, that's fine. So on that, Graham, is we've talked about how players can use their sort of strengths. Is one, how do you sell to a player to use other attributes when they are can be so dependent on one? And two, is it necessarily a bad thing that they're identifying these key um, attributes they're good at and then building their play style around that for future? I think uh, with this, education is really important. So um trying to ensure that we're not it, i work with under 13s at the moment so we i need to make sure that they understand that i'm talking about uh, potential as opposed to what they're doing now today because there's lots of things that are going to change in terms of their pathway um the level of opposition as they get older it doesn't sort of ramp up getting players to understand that can you hear me yeah okay. So it's not sequential. So when a player goes from um, sort of 13s to 14s, it's the, the jump from 13s to 14s isn't isn't massive. But when they get to sort of 16s to 18s, the you know the jump is is quite big. So that for getting them to understand the development pathway um, is really important. And what is successful today doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be successful in the future. Now I don't I don't wish to um, sort of detract from what they're good at so if they are strong and powerful then that might be the the thing that makes them the player that they potentially might be one day so we don't want to come away from that but they also need to understand that they need to be multi-functional they need to understand that the situation might demand different things uh, depending on the opponent depending on the state of the game etc so trying to make sure that they're more rounded and giving them that education uh, and that's difficult for a young player to understand, especially if their parents see them as you know, he's a number nine at 12s, um, but he might not be a number nine at 18, 19, 23, when he makes his first team debut. So trying to get them to understand that we're trying to develop a, a rounded athlete that can do different things in different situations and understands the needs of the game and can deploy those tools as and when appropriate. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult sell initially, but I think it's an ongoing education piece um, with a player and parents uh, to ensure that they understand that long-term journey they're on. Yeah, and then Arnie said there about players changing positions as they grow up. Do you think there is a place for sort of starting at a specialization in that, in that position? Or do you find a more of a sampling approach to each position has greater benefits or different benefits? I think, again, it's it's very individual, but my own bias and preference is on sort of a early diversification and sampling. So getting them to play different sports, different positions, um, rather than specialising too early. I don't think football is an early specialisation sport. Um, I don't think you start playing at striker at under nines and then progress all the way through. It's not linear in that respect. Lots of things change and there's lots of variables that impact on that development um, pathway. So, yeah, I'm in, in favour of... a uh, a sampling um, sort of approach where players do play different positions and understand a more rounded perspective of the game rather than specialising too early. And do you find that is easy or hard to sell to the parents that might think their player is going to be the striker in the future? It is a tough sell initially because players and parents will have the, like their, their identity. They may have formed this identity, I'm a striker, I score goals. Um, and trying to get them to appreciate that that's not always going to be the case and that we're trying to coach for the future game and what we believe that might look like. Um, so it is difficult to challenge that identity if they're quite fixed to that. Um, so it is an ongoing education piece yeah. with, with players and parents and it can be a challenge 
initially. That's great. And then we're going to carry on the screening, but the negative side of screening. So David, um, with screening in terms of a sports science approach, can you find that it, the negative side uh, like can be um, too often? So some clubs constantly seeing that their players increasing? Yeah, I, th I think there's definitely a disadvantage to testing too often. Um, often with some tests, you see such high variability that there's differences that you might see from um, one test to the next. If the gap between the tests is too short, might just be error in the measurement rather than um, actual changes. Obviously, also screening often takes a long time. Um, so if you do a full screening battery, you could end up spending a lot of time doing that and interpreting the results and then feeding those back to coaches. And after you go through all that process, if you've got another screening period very soon after that, you just end in this eternal cycle of that's the only thing you're doing. Um, obviously, there's also the, the weighing up of the time that you're spending to improve those scores that you are collecting. You, if you're doing screening all the time, you're not actually spending time making the players faster or making them move better because you're always testing them. Um, so it's it's always a balance and it's it needs to be a balance in this in that way of not too often and then but not too far apart that you're not getting consistent enough data to see those changes um i don't think that anyone there's any set rules on how you could balance that i think the environment that you're working in and the club and your resources and all stuff all that sort of stuff would dictate what's the most appropriate strategy for that particular club or environment? Yeah, I personally follow the screen as a coach approach. So like every time I coach someone, I'm screening them in the athletes, see how they're moving. And then yeah. obviously do the formal stuff every so often. Do you find that screening is sometimes a trap from sports science strength coaches to prove their worth to coaches? They're just doing stuff to so show they are improving and they're worth what they're doing basically. And they get some buy-in from the coaches. Um, I, I don't know. I, I've not experienced that personally. I think that there's potentially a, potential of falling down that hole of look, oh, look at all these fantastic results that I've created with, with, we're improving stuff. I think the biggest difference and the biggest, um, sort of badge of honor you can get as a, a sports scientist is when someone picks out something of those in-game differences, but thinks that it's attributed to the work you're doing. Like, oh, such and such looks fitter today, or he looks faster, or he's performing better because we've got him back from this injury successfully, or all of those sort of things. And you have those ongoing conversations. And then also the sort of multidisciplinary environment of, say, if you've got a player that's not particularly good at defending 1v1s, you then train them in terms of, uh, change of direction and agility from a sports science perspective, but also combined with the football coach to deliver more 1v1 defending to them in the game. And then that might ultimately mean that they start improving in those skills and get to move from one age group to the next or get a professional contract and those sort of things. I think that's a better way of focusing on what you're doing as a sports scientist rather than, oh, look, everyone's got a new top speed this week or their yeah. FMS scores have gone up or that, that sort of stuff. So that's a really great, great way of looking at it. Um, and then Sean, uh, one for you is, is the pressure of the athletes to um, conform to these screenings, as you mentioned with the cultural effects of when someone's growing, do you see the negative of telling especially younger athletes you have to hit these certain targets or these are the certain targets and um, the pressure that comes along with that later on into their career? Not sure if there's a huge amount of pressure, certainly on the targets. Uh, the challenges we've probably come into has been more so the case of, you know, adjusting certainly training programs based upon maturity info. So, for example, if we've got a kid who's maybe a late developer and they're being asked to play down, and sometimes we have some issues and challenges there. But I think it's nothing that without education uh, being put in place that you can't overcome. But uh, uh, I, I really don't know that much about the application of, of uh, the sports science in the professional community. So I really wouldn't be able to comment about the pressures put on the athletes. And then Graham, could you see any pressures or are you the same? Um, no, not necessarily pressures. I think like DJ 
uh, mentioned earlier, we tend to put our fitness testing results into um, biological sort of vans. So we're, we're comparing them across their biological age, um, which is really good for us as coaches because you know, it just changes the lens for us rather than viewing them in their age group or their year group, we can see where they might be performing. So they might be bottom of their current group, but when you put them into their biological age, they're actually performing above and beyond um, their peers. So I guess in terms of um, problems with the screen in it, like David did say, it, it takes time and there's certain intervals in the season that we, we do this. I guess from my perspective as a coach, um, it's sometimes I question sort of the ecological validity. So are the players, because they do it so regular and often, are they just learning the test or how does that apply to the game? So a player might be really quick over um, 10, 20, 30 metres, but when you view them in the game, that doesn't seem to correlate. So because of this, the, um, you know, the cues and the triggers and the stimulus is not there. So how do we sort of address that issue? That's, that's one problem then with the, chemist roach approach i think and sean is far more um educated on that than me but um i think a lot of the longitudinal research has been done on white boys of you know, white ethnicity so i don't know the answer but there may be some issues for us as a club and it's something that we're looking into in terms of a bane population so does that also correlate to to certain um ethnicities for us and i guess the other problem might be that self-reported heights for parents and I know there's a margin of error that's in in the algorithm but again I don't know my height off the top of my head I would have a guess a rough approximation of what it is but we we're using that as we put it into the algorithm and I know there is a margin for error but that might be a problem again David and Sean know a lot more than me but from my perspective as a coach they would be some of the issues that I might see but I don't see too many issues with screening I think it's a positive thing as long as we take it with context and we understand what we're looking at. That's great. And then Sean, you got anything to add on what uh, Graham said there? Or Yeah, so when it comes to the parent height, the correlation between self-reported and uh, actual parent height is around 0 0.95, 0 0.97. So we're talking about quite small margins of error, uh, particularly when we compare it against, say, psychological questionnaires where the error might be through the roof. Uh, we also need to keep in mind as well that the biological parent height is a small part of that equation. Uh, one of my colleagues in the US used to play around with the equation, add a lot of error on it, have limited bearing in terms of the outputs afterwards, but it's definitely something you would certainly want to consider. With regards to uh, different ethnic groups, uh, we know that certain ethnic groups will typically mature in advance or delay of others. Again, uh, these are just general averages, though. You know, the variance within the races is much greater than the variance between. So if we look at African-Caribbean boys, they will typically mature about a year in advance of white boys. Uh, but again, the variance uh, within the race is much bigger than the variance between. With respect to the Camus Roche, the one group where we found it to be particularly problematic, I think, is probably more so South Asians, so people from, say, Vietnam, from Singapore, who typically will be smaller, so it's probably over-predicting their heights by about five or six centimetres, and so naturally that's going to influence uh, the overall, uh, you know, percentages that are coming through. Uh, but across most other ethnic groups, you know, the, the patterns of growth are relatively similar in terms of when kids are going through growth spots and the, the patterns and the trajectories that they take. So, uh, so, yeah, it's definitely something to consider, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe it's not as big an issue as we might think it is. That's great. And then, David, anything you need to add? Or? Uh, yeah, I was just going to talk again about what Graham has said about the ecological validity of the testing. And I think it's a really good point and something that's often overlooked from a sports science perspective of just because somebody's fastest from zero to 10 metres doesn't mean that they would arrive at the football first. And obviously there's a lot of cognitive um, and psychological skills of understanding opposition triggers, understanding where the ball's going to travel next and anticipating those sort of things that can dramatically affect whether you arrive there first. Um, I think that often relates to differences from in a perspective from the sports scientist to a coach. And we have this sometimes where coaches will go, oh, such and such is fast. And you'll look at the testing score and you know, well, actually he's bang average or below average, but just because he always gets the ball first or uses his physical qualities at the right times, it appears like 
he is fast. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the physical qualities aren't, aren't as important. It just means that it's something to consider when reporting that testing data back that you wouldn't want to say this person's slow or this person's mm -hmm. fast. It's just they're performing better in, in that particular test or worse. And then how obviously then the interdisciplinary approach of how you then improve somebody's speed or arriving at a football first, then need to be both a physical part as well as a understanding of the game and drills within a context of a football match to improve that. No, I think that's great. I think uh, the strength side and the speed side should be used in, a in conjunction with the technical side. So maybe yeah. use it as a how to identify limiting factor, not to say this will be a limiting factor once we get the coach's input from that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, on bias, it's going to be mainly for Graham, for the applied side is with everything going on with maturation, with the different um, processes, is how do you avoid selection bias or attempt to avoid selection bias from early and late maturers? I think probably the start point is to bring the bias into consciousness. So we all we all carry bias, whether it's because of our experiences or our background or our education. We, we've all got biases and we carry them with us. So it's mainly bringing those into consciousness so we understand them and we're aware of them. And then we can start to have that conversation around challenging them. Um, I think probably from my experiences, biobanding was was something that was I found really useful as a tool to challenge coaches' perspectives, um, sort of recalibr recalibrate their assessment of a player, because you might have a player that is in a group that's a standout player, um, but when you put them into their biological groups and that player might now be competing with players of similar maturation status, they might not stand out as much. And similarly, you might have a, a smaller, later maturing player within the group who then is, you take away the physical um, advantage or disadvantage that they may have and you put them against people of a similar maturity, all of a sudden you can now see that player really flourish. Um, so it's not to say that you would do this all the time because I think that the problem is that we might then create something, you know, a reality that doesn't exist. Um, there probably is always going to be that physical difference, but it just gives us an opportunity to maybe check and challenge those biases that we may hold and our assumption that a player is good or bad based on their performance. And it enables us to have a look at potential and look for a different lens. Um, so I think, yeah, first and foremost, we need to know that we have biases and what those biases are. And then we need to open up conversations and environment where we can check and challenge those. And one of the tools, especially around growth and maturation, my perspective and working with DJ at Bournemouth, uh, biobanding was introduced again um, by Ben Bradley there. We do it at Southampton now. It's, it's a really useful tool um, and that enables us to really have a look at those biases and are we selecting or deselecting players based on growth and maturation or the advantages that they present or are we considering um, all facets and aspects of performance and development? That's great. And then, Sean, I've heard a lot of you speak about this and the bias of a coach and I. So if you want to um, talk about sort of the research side of this. Yeah, so we've been working with Southampton for quite some time now. And uh, my PhD student, Megan Hill, who's working with uh, Sam Scott there at Southampton, was particularly interested in this area. They went through five years years worth of historical data and were able to identify a bias that was really starting to come through in the 14s, 15s and 16s. And uh, so we knew that, you know, these boys are bigger, faster and stronger. But, you know, these metrics, while important, aren't the key metrics in terms of making decisions about retain and release. So we actually went and we looked at five years worth of uh, match performance data where we looked at the match grades. So players are scored in a one to four scale based on their performance. And of course, we could look at the boys when they were most mature and least mature and through the 14s 15s and 16s uh, the early maturing boys or the most mature boys were getting the higher grades and uh, so uh, what they've done at Southampton since then 
is often they will be playing players up and playing players down. So they'll get a chance to see these boys in different contexts. And uh, the nice thing as well is you can actually look at the match grades for when the boy is most mature or least mature. Uh, I know at Southampton as well, they go through reading through the boys in terms of or order of maturity when they're, when they're looking at making decisions. So growth and maturation is at the forefront of their discussions. And uh, certainly with some of the more recent data we've taken from the previous season, we've seen a reduction in those biases, a drop of about, I think we calculated about 89% reduction in that bias. So I think if you've got proactive clubs such as Southampton, Bournemouth, Man United really going to town on this area as well just now, where they put growth and maturation, they hold it as a central factor within the decision-making process. It doesn't lead the decision-making process, but it informs the decision-making process. And if you get a chance to see boys in different contexts, you can take those differences in maturity into account, focus more upon technical, tactical, psychological skills, and maybe over the, the, the overall true ability and potential of the athlete. And yeah, we're starting to get some success in the clubs now that these biases are starting to be mitigated, which is wonderful. And again, a lot of these ideas have been driven by the clubs and the practitioners in there, so kudos to them. That's great. It's like you said, as Graham said, is the consciousness of understanding that that is there yeah. and that uh, can uh, help with that. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, with a, a club like Southampton, uh, uh, the level of understanding and knowledge of growth and maturation within their clubs, their physios, it's something that would be akin to a graduate student. You know, these practitioners there at Southampton and Bournemouth are incredibly clued up in the subject matter now, more so than some of the academics. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's great to see the the benefits of that starting to come through now. That's great. Um, one of the stories I've heard on the pre-podcast was about the bibs. Um, you see, yeah. if you uh, tell that one, I think that's pretty good. That was a study that came out of uh, David Mann uh, at PSV Eindhoven. They had a very strong relative age effect. And uh, so what they did is they wanted to understand how they could overcome the relative age effect. And uh, so they felt that the coaches and the scouts were key factors in, in terms of determining that. So they set up a bunch of 4v4 games where they had boys of, of different quarters, you know, quarter ones through to quarter fours. And uh, they didn't tell the coaches about the ages of the boys. They looked at the evaluations of the boys across these games. And lo and behold, quarter ones, fantastic grades, quarter fours, really poor grades. So they thought, well, okay, well, what if we educate the coaches and scouts? We give them the birth dates. Will that help them compensate for the age effect? And no, it didn't at all. You know, they looked at the scores afterwards and the quarter ones are still getting great grades. Quarter fours are getting poor grades. They said and said, well, okay, well, let's make this a little bit more salient for them. Let's give the kids a bunch of bibs where number one is the oldest boy all the way through to number eight is the youngest boy. So they've got this visual cue to remind them about differences in relative age. They then evaluated the data at the end again, and what they found was a complete mitigation of the relative age effect in terms of the bias. So it suggested that these visual cues in terms of helping the coaches identify who is older, who is younger, was quite useful in terms of them better evaluating and taking relative age into account. Now, we replicated that with an MSCI study with Southampton Football Club, but looking at biological maturity. You could argue that biological maturity is arguably even more important because the relative age effect is limited to one year. Biological maturity can be anywhere to four to five years in terms of variance within an age group. And what we found was that exactly the same strategy worked an absolute treat in terms of taking care of the uh, maturity evaluation bias. So I guess this is why it's so important to educate coaches about the importance of the subject, to make everybody aware that certain individuals are more or less mature. And if you can make that easier by helping scouts or coaches recognise what the differences are between an early and late maturer, because you can eyeball them, you can pick them out quite easily if you know the processes of change that occur during puberty, uh, or if you can use things such as visual cues to help identify players who might have certain types of advantages. And I know that some of the Premier League Academy clubs already can do this for scouting purposes already. No, I think that, that, that study was really good for the kind of reiterates the point of that consciousness. That's why I wanted to add that in there. Um, now we're going to move on to LTAD models. So like the Gallyhu and the traditional LTAD model. Uh, and the, their sort of place, I know your university systems for my four years bash the LTAD models and how you should use them or how to guide you sort of practice. Uh, and then when more into the practice side, they kind of kind of use bits from that and make their own internal club um, LTAD models. Now I'll go kind of break down each of you, but Graham, how have your sort of clubs done that and the LTAD models sort of approach? And do you think that the LTAD models are more reflected of the end goal in terms of that club's play style or 
if that has any to do with it. Yeah, so I think the, the framework that we use is Lloyd and Oliver, um, so the youth physical development model. Yeah. Um, but then from that, I think they the, the, the club and, and um, Sean has referred to the, the good work that Sam's done at the academy. Um, they've taken that model and then sort of developed and expanded upon it for their, our specific context and what we're after as a club. Um, so, for example, they've integrated lots of multi-sport criteria um, and that comes from athletic skills model. So, you know, Sam and the, the sports science department believe in the, the uh, sampling of different sports and they integrate that into the sports science warm up. So it's mainly a, a multi-sport approach. So the framework is from Lloyd and Oliver and then different models or different ways of doing things have then been adapted and applied and layered them on top of that. And then the on-pitch stuff that the sports science do is mainly a uh, constraints-led approach. So there might be some implicit constraints. Um, so the, the players have to recognise cues and triggers and self-organise, or there might be some explicit like if-then rules that they need to apply to in the, in the sports science warm-up. Um, and then intertwined with all of this is the growth and maturation, the data that we collect as well. So you've got the long-term athlete development model. You've then got some other models that are layered in based on our context and what we believe to be appropriate for age and stage development. And then on top of that, you've got all the great data that we collect. And again, Sean referred to Megan's work last year was some of the work that she was producing was fantastic, which has then led to some papers being published. Um, the, the Gallagher um, hourglass model, I like it because it brings in sort of environmental, individual and sort of um, hereditary factors. So, you know, the, I like the fact that there's, there's some consideration of that, but it's not a model that I'm particularly familiar with. Um, like I say, mainly it's Lloyd and Oliver um, that we use. And then any, Sean, do you, any of the research side? Yeah, so uh, when the Ballier LTAD model came out, yeah, I got a lot of bashing. Uh, but to be absolutely honest, you know, if you actually look at the basics of the model, it's good in terms of it recognises the importance of considering the long-term athletic development. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were criticisms. Yes, there were limitations of the model, but it was a good place to start from. And so I think he needs to at least be recognised for that. I would agree that people such as uh, John Oliver and Roger Lloyd at Cardiff Met have done a lot to improve those kind of approaches and models, and they've done a lovely job of integrating growth and maturation in there and I think the nice thing as well is that they, they're quite clear in terms of that you know growth and maturity should be there not to lead a program but to inform a program so you know you may have a kid who's in a certain band and capable of hypertrophy for example post puberty but if they can't do a proper squat they can't do any kind of proper cleaner or any kind of lift then they shouldn't be engaging in those types of activities so I think John and Rodri uh, you know hats off to them they've done a really nice job of uh presenting a model which clubs can use and most clubs that I go into are kind of utilizing that framework but uh, also there's some nice practical guidance as well so uh, I think you know these guys are leading in that area and it's a solid model but you know as much as Ballier gets a lot of criticism I think we have to say fair dues to them for actually bringing it to the fore in the first place. So again when the uni we did use it as a guide more than a sort of a set structure which I think as a guide it is pretty good yeah. And um, the one thing which but more coaches did use from it is the fun bit in the fundamentals is that transfers through more ages. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people do forget that they are still children and yeah. they kind of can forget the fun side. Yeah. So I just want yeah, I think part of the problem was the fact that, uh, you know, Value has been described as an expert in this particular area of talent mm -hmm. identification and development. And certainly from an academic research perspective he barely had any papers behind his name maybe four or five or something very few actually in that area so uh, i think there was probably a lot of academics who looked at that and felt that you know it wasn't deserved that statement etc and that this should be their kind of area so there probably was some sort of petty jealousy here and there but i think fair dues to the guy it was an important first step it wasn't perfect and there was a lot of holes to some extent which have been flagged up but that's how science is science is about building on ideas that's great. And then David, anything for you on the LTD model? Yeah, similar to how Millsy was describing his, the philosophy at Southampton, we have used the models to sort of start as a guideline and a basis and then implemented our own sort of unique style upon those and built upon step by step and added layers into that. Um, I think Sean raised a really good point there as well about 
the sort of individual aspects of it. Just because a certain player is in a particular phase doesn't mean that what it says on the model is the right thing for them at that time. Um, you can often get players that come in later on in the academy, sort of under under 16s, 18s, where it would tell you to do particular uh, physical qualities with them, but actually they have such a low training age that you need to start from right back at the start with those fundamentals that you're talking about. Um, so really useful as a guideline, but you need to put your own spin on it depending upon the context and the environment. And lots of the stuff that we do within the club is based upon the constraints of what we have, but also matching the club's philosophy. And we have obviously our own sort of physical development philosophy that ties into that as well. And you're sort of working in that sort of multidisciplinary environment of how do we produce the best athletes and players through this period and what information can we get from research and what information can we get from the practical side to allow us to build the best framework that we can that's also flexible but individualized for the players. That's great. So we've touched upon it a few times now, but biobanding. Um, so if one of you want to give a quick um, dem uh, word now, quick exp explanation. That's the one explanation of uh, what biobanding is, uh, and then we'll go on to competition versus training biobanding. So who wants to take the lead? Sean's got to take the lead, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a definition for it. Uh, it's actually in the uh, dictionaries, in the Collins English Dictionary now, but they put the wrong definition in there. It doesn't quite make sense. But uh, in its contemporary sense, biobanding is the grouping of athletes uh, based upon characteristics associated with growth and maturity rather than age specifically, and that it can be applied in the context of training, it can be applied in relation to say, uh, talent evaluation, or the grouping of players in competition. So what we're really doing is we're, we're, we're using attributes associated with growth and maturity to evaluate or group players in, in different ways. That's great. So David, um, the first thing we're gonna do is competition versus training by abandoning. Now, I know a lot of things are based off like the tournaments we do. Yeah. As a strength or the person doing the strength training, we accidentally kind of do by abandoning by the skill level we do it at. Um, do you f think there's to be more of that or just can we do it naturally anyway? Yeah, so uh, Bournemouth have been involved in lots of sort of tournaments in terms of by abandoning, but we obviously regularly by band throughout the season anyway for training purposes. So we have a, a cycle that we uh, sort of, take place over the season and part of that cycle is in-house biobanded training and then either a, get a fixture against another team or um, a in-house fixture which is based upon that grouping based upon maturity and growth. Um, in terms of sort of the sports science s &C side obviously we discussed previously about testing in biobanded groups and comparing players from that perspective but like you said there's that um, skill and gym based element and in the previous question I spoke about our physical development framework that is firstly based upon skill and movement quality and then the second phase below that is what stage they are at in terms of maturity so you could have um, a player whose skill and quality is poor but post peak height velocity who would still focus on those movement techniques in an unloaded pattern to develop those movement qualities and then once you move past that movement quality that then would help inform the programming you do but uh, as you'd always think as an snc practitioner you need you need the players to be safe first and therefore applying something that's appropriate for their stage but not appropriate for the individual would be the wrong thing to do and that that's a really key consideration there of how you how you match those players and then so from our sort of framework within the club that's really flexible in the sense that it's it's all individualized based upon a few certain factors of what they do in their gym sessions and their um, on pitch based sessions based upon the firstly what's safe and appropriate for them at that time and movement quality then also based upon maturity the club's philosophy the physical development philosophy and then in under the club's philosophy you have stuff like positional differences at the later stages of um the, the older age groups yeah, on that, um, 
a bit off topic, but on individualized training at that age is how much is individualized and how much is just we need to practice the fundamentals, the squat, X, Y, Z, um, and how much do we need to, this person is lacking here, how would we get them to there? I, I, it's sort of like a, a sliding scale, really. So at the youngest ages, you've got the largest proportion on those fundamentals, and at the sort of top end, you've got the smallest proportion based upon that and the largest based upon the individualization and what they need to become an, an elite player. So when you're talking 18s, 21s, um, and then obviously the sort of individualized rather than being performance individualized to a game, but the individual as in their training age, their maturity in that would then adjust where they are on that scale as well. And we generally try to individualize as much as possible. So we have, we can have subgroups within age groups, or if we've got multiple age groups together as a pre coronavirus thing, you could then split those and sort of match players where they what they need to learn and what their stage they're at and just sort of get rid of those arbitrary barriers of he's in the 13s he's in the 14s so they're doing different programs it's more of a fluid approach than that that's great and then on graham how do you or how would you integrate uh, bioband in training compared to competition <clears throat> yeah so probably going back to uh the long-term athlete development model in bali um you know, there was a lot of stuff that got binned in there, but one of the things, the terminology of uh, learning and competing. So we, we talk, in, a lot of coaches refer to it winning versus development as though it's on a continuum and they're competing against each other. But actually, I think you can get, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. So learning and competing, we can get both of those. Um, so what we did previously was every six week review period, um, we would do like weeks two, four and six might be by band and training. So generally it would be a small sided game format across the youth development phase. So different conditions aligned to the topics that we're working on. And at the end of that six week period, we would then play a fixture against another academy in a by banded format. So we tried to sort of bring the two together. And that was really important when we were starting out because A, the players didn't really understand what by banded was because they saw it as, oh, I'm playing down or you know, as a reward for playing up. Um, whereas actually we probably needed to do a better job of explaining what the benefits were and why we were doing it and the rationale so people understood it. And also the coaches was a bit of a tough sell originally. Um, it was almost like international week. So, you know, like it's football, but it feels different. So everyone looks forward to Premier League at the weekend and there is a football match at the weekend, but it just doesn't feel quite the same. Um, and that was what coaches were like. So they, they sort of just didn't really get it at first. So that education was really, really important. I think it will stem back and I think probably Sean was involved in this study, but I think Southampton did a, uh, a pilot and I think Stoke City played in it. I think probably about 2015, 2014, 15 time. 15, yep. Yeah. And we at Bournemouth at the time, we saw that myself and Ben and, you know, it was of interest to us because we didn't have the big resource base and we needed to find different ways of doing things. And it was something that we were really interested in and, and Ben to his credit then started to work with myself and we, we got it into that youth development phase and it become, you know, Part of our program and obviously DJ and the work that's taking on so that coach education probably has moved on a lot but I was probably there in the earlier stages where it was all about education and making sure that we had real clarity around what it was and what the purpose was it wasn't there to compete or find space in the program it was to give a, a balanced diet and provision so that we could give different tools and different ways of doing things it's just like you know technical practice is going to highlight the technical competence of a player Games are going to highlight the game understanding and game intelligence, game craft. Biobanding is just going to give us an opportunity to have a look at, take away the physical um, imbalance and it gives us another pair of eyes or a, a fresh lens through which we can look. Um, and once we got over that, we started to see some progress. So that was the way that we introduced it, a combination of training, which led into competition. That's great. Just important when you're thinking about biobanding is that I often get messages from other clubs and practitioners looking to implement it i think that often people think it's more simple and straightforward as just okay we'll just group the players in these set groups and that and that's sorted i think there's a lot of nuance in how you group them all the logistical demands of changing schedules moving coaches around you can often like 
Graham was mentioning there, there can be some often difficulties and barriers to implementing it straight away. And it might not be just plain sailing and as simple as possible. I think the uh, as part of that, it's really therefore important to consider how you're gonna plan and implement it and have a real purpose to it and get the coaches on board, explain what you're gonna do, how you're gonna get out of it, what you're going to get out of it and evaluate what's going on and that was something the coaches really pushed for recently is evaluating the players in both environments so like Graham saying looking at players through a different lens and being able to compare them but actually therefore evaluating them in one context and another to highlight any differences and actually keep a track and a record of what's going on rather than just doing it for the sake of doing it there's got to be some real purpose behind what you do. No, I think that's very important for when this sort of uh, method gets put out into the amateur clubs. I yeah. know at the moment, some of the premiership and um, the academies are using it, but soon some of the coaches start seeing the academies using it and then taking it back to their home clubs or a sports scientist might go to an amateur club. There will be a lot of uh, room for error where they're just going, oh, we're going to play these ages, these ages. So, so I'm definitely um, looking into different areas and where it might go wrong. I think that's a very good point to make yeah definitely um so just a quick break unfortunately david has had to jump off so just want to thank david for coming on helping organize this podcast it wouldn't have been possible without his help um and secondly if you'd like to contact david then twitter is the best place to find him at david underscore johnson 11 um any questions um i'm sure i'd be happy to help uh, other than that let's get back to the podcast do you notice or when a buyer banning game goes on? Like what actually does it look like? Um, so uh, yeah, I think probably back then people were expecting to see all the players of a similar height, um, which obviously isn't the case. It's, it's relative to what your adult height is going to be. So um, first people were saying, oh, they're not applying the same method as us or, you know, whatever. But that was the reality of buyer banning and that education over a period of time, um, yeah, I think by abandoning now, from when I heard about it in 2015 to where it's moved on now, we've, we've got so much more knowledge in this area. Um, but yeah, what it looks like on the pitch, I guess it just looks like a, a normal game of football. Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel any different. I think probably the the fact that it might not be as physical, the, the, the bigger players might not stand out um, as much and there might be an opportunity for the smaller players to express themselves and do things that you might not see on a regular basis in their own age group because they just don't have the capability yet to be able to do it um so it's just again it's just offering us a different perspective on on a player's current level of performance um so i don't think it f looks any different to a normal game of football hopefully it doesn't to, to most people but um i think once you take away that apprehension around it and it's like you know the coaches were like well this is the sports science you know they're taking over this weekend it's it's there but it's not it's if we understand it better and work um sort of interdisciplinary i think it can have big benefits um so yeah I, to answer your question i don't think it looks too dissimilar just it might just not have the the, the physical um dominance or the, the success that a, a physical player might have in a normal given week that's that's the only difference from my perspective yeah, not people expecting just a big boisterous group where everyone's bashing into each other and they're being a bit more sort of a, a technical group as well. Um, but like I said, on that sort of interdis interdisciplinary sort of teams, I think a lot of times uh, the strength sessions are SNC, the speed session SNC, the field sessions are technical coaches. I think more clubs are moving towards that. Everyone's involved in a session, the planning. And especially by abandoning, like you said, it's some it's this better and conditioning. We're actually we might be doing the testing, but it comes down to your guys' uh, observations, and it comes to actually benefits you a lot more and seeing these players in different lights. Yeah, I think we we as coaches are very good at sort of compartmentalizing things and you know breaking things down, so it's nice and neat and tidy. Um, but the problem with that, you know, is it's not particularly holistic and it should all be integrated. So the strength, the technical ability of a player is supported by the other four, the other three corners. Um, they shouldn't be viewed really in isolation. They should work together. 
Um, so I guess a question really for Sean, if I can. Um, what I really like about biobanding is obviously that you, you take out the physical aspect, but I think if, is there any research that you know of where they've also brought in some psych banding into it as well? So for example, we used to have uh, like, like small sided games on a Monday night. So we used to predominantly be uh, biobanded. So we would know their percentage of their, their adult height um, and put them into groups. And then within those groups, then we would maybe have the big five inventory or the CSI 28. And so we would know, you know, which players were good at coping with adversity and which ones weren't and which ones maybe were more introvert and which ones were more extrovert. And then we would, within those bands, we would even band further to bring in. So you're bringing in more corners of development as opposed to just the, the physical. Do you know of that or is that something that's being done? It's something that's been suggested, you know, when there's been this general sort of critical discussion around the banding, people will say, well, what about grouping by psychological uh, skill sets? Uh, I would argue that probably age groups to some degree maybe that in terms of certainly cognitive development, motor development of experience, because all of those things will typically follow age. Uh, but if you're looking at particular qualities such as, you know, uh, ability to handle anxiety, adaptive skills, for example, I don't think anybody he's really ever done that uh, I think probably the most exciting stuff on the psychological side is some of the stuff that Amy Spencer has been doing to support the biobanding at uh, <clears throat> Southampton uh, when we first started doing the biobanding a lot, a lot of the sports psychologists were up in arms because you know you can't do that you know because there'll be differences in terms of the older boys and the younger boys and their psychological skills and uh, yeah, that is true to some extent, but you could equally apply that argument to the age groups and the differences in the physical qualities. Uh, but uh, some very smart and uh, sort of proactive sports psychologists, such as Amy, said, actually, no, we have a role in this as sports psychologists to support the early maturing playing player who's playing up and the late maturing player who's playing down. So there's early maturing boys who've had all that success. You're going to play them up. They're going to fail. And for many of these boys, it might be the first time they've really struggled with the adversity. So actually making sure that you can provide them with skill sets at that point of time so almost align the psych support training for the whole process of playing up was really important and likewise if you've got a late maturing uh, say older boy who's playing down uh, actually preparing them for that situation where they take on the leadership type of role and a lot of that research can actually be discussed and considered in relation to research which has been studied in developmental psychology looking at mixed age classrooms. There's a whole host of uh, research uh, studies in this area by people like Vygotsky who've looked at what happens when you take kids of different age groups and you throw them together. Um, what they actually find is that there actually are benefits. It's not a problem. In fact, if anything, there's actually more benefits to children in engaging in that way. The older kids consolidate their learning by understanding and teaching and demonstrating and role modeling. And the younger kids who are maybe your early developers playing up, they strive to be like the older kids. So mixing it up here and there actually is of benefit rather than actually being a problem. And of course, uh, people like Vygotsky talked about how you can use scaffolding to you know, increase the likelihood that you prepare players for this process of playing up and playing down. So they better understand the purpose and they have the skill sets to benefit from that. And I know that... Uh, one of the fellows up at uh, used to be coaching at Man United. He's now with the FA. I should remember his name. It, it, it goes from my mind just now. But uh, he was applying those principles when United were playing players up or playing players down uh, uh, throughout their academy, uh, the whole kind of Vygotskian approach to scaffolding. So I think there's a lot that can actually be done to support the players going up and down there. And I think Amy Spencer at Southampton is really kind of leading in good practice in that area. And, you know, it was nice to see some psychologists actually embrace the process and see it as a challenge and see their role rather than just simply attacking the process and saying it was uh, uh, unfounded. I hope that answers your question, Graham. Um, yeah, thank you. It's very, very thorough. Um, so, again, you can jump in on this one, or Sean, if you want, but how do you sell biobanding to the players and coaches? So yeah. when we've used it in the past, they've first come to me for some athletic development and they've um, been a bit down, they've sort of done something bad. Mm -hmm. But when we did explain to them the process behind it, um, they actually enjoyed it and they saw it was a benefit. Um, I think this is actually more to do with the parents as well sometimes. They don't really understand it. Um, but how do you guys sell it to players, parents and coaches? 
I, I can start on that one if you want. That's great. Yeah. So when we first did the Bonnie Banyan tournaments, we really hadn't got a clue what was going to come out, so we kind of went into it blind. But when we actually found what the benefits were, that allowed us to actually go through the process of educating not just coaches, but also players and parents on the process of playing up and playing down. And a big one was the issue of playing down because a lot of people will see it as a social stigma. In fact, there's some clubs out there who will not allow their players to play down because they see it as causing social stigma for them. And if you're good enough, you should be able to compete within the age group. And uh, some of the coaches at those clubs are actually sitting there going, you know, we're losing our best players because of this. Because for some players, it's right. It's the right thing to do for them. But it's about educating them, telling them why they are playing down. Uh, John McEwen at Everton, I remember him chatting to me after one of our FA, it was actually one of our Premier League workshops, and uh, he was uh, talking about some of their first experiences with biobanding, and they had a very talented boy uh, who was probably one of the best boys in, in his age group, but also was a late developer, so naturally he went down with a bunch of wee lads, and uh, he came back after a day going, John, what am I doing? You know, this is no challenge. There's no benefit to me at all. And John said, look, you're looking at the wrong challenge. He says, in your age group, you're not a leader. And if you to be successful in our club, you need to have developed these kind of qualities. I want you to go down. I want you to organize these boys, manage these boys, motivate, communicate, all those types of things. And as soon as the kid understood that and went back, he had a fantastic experience. And so this is kind of what Amy will be doing in her work as she makes sure she explains to the kids why it is you're playing down. Yes, you're going to have your age group games, but every now and then we're going to challenge you in different ways to make you see those kind of abilities start to come through. And likewise, with the early developing boys, you know, if you stay in your age group, you're not going to develop the abilities which we need you to develop. That's why we're going to push you up. And we're going to support you through that process and give you the skills to help you adapt to that challenge. But, you know, if you don't do that, you, you're, you're going to come short at some point of time. So it's about education and explaining and removing the stigma. That club that I said uh, who were complaining about their boys not being allowed to play down at that session, uh, one of the clubs from it was actually one of the coaches from Tottenham put up his hand and he says, look, with regards to the social stigma, he says that two of our boys who are now in our first team played down the pretty much through the entire academy. So if I was asking a boy to play down, I would say, look, you're on the so-and-so pathway and he would name that player. He says Southampton could do the same thing. You're on the Alex Oxley chamberlain pathway. All of a sudden you normalise it and you explain the process of it and see it as a route to success. Then I think you can overcome it. And the problem is, is if you don't allow for those opportunities, you're potentially facing some of the best players because for a late developing boy to actually be retained in the system, they've got to be off the charts technically, tactically, psychologically uh, in order just to survive. They won't be the best player, but just to survive. And if you potentially release that boy because you're not taking into differences in, in uh, physical maturity, then you're potentially losing your best players and investing in the wrong folk. Hey, can grab. <laughs> uh, yeah, I probably just reiterate what uh, Sean has just said there. So, um, I think it's looking at the benefits from different perspectives. So you've got uh, an early maturer that can play up and maybe exposed to higher intensities, have to work harder, learn from older players. So um, you know, be challenged more on a physical and technical, tactical perspective. And then you've got the, the later maturers that maybe the challenge for them is you know, to be the best player on the pitch, to go down and be a leader. Um, some of the psychosocial um, demands of the game so you might focus on those um, and it does help if you've got players you know, we all like uh, you know a case study or an example that we can give to a young player if they know there's a player like um, Oxlade Chamberlain or Paul Scholes that have played down for periods of their development and you can tell them that um, you know they then start to see the value and can understand it so it's it's creating that co connection between their development and the game or the tool that we're using rather than just giving them the content so again it's connection over content for me and that education process and if you've got if you're fortunate enough to have you know, psychologists working and, and explaining those things repeating those messages for you it's just a, a really joined up process um but yeah I, I wouldn't really be adding too much more to what sean said. i think the probably the ones in the middle um you know what what would be the the thing because we've given examples of the early and the later mature is there what about the ones in the middle sean I think what you can do is you can orchestrate games where you can still move those players up and down. I think you don't just want to leave them, you know, in that situation where they're just the middle of the pack. You want to have situations where they're challenged. You want to have situations where they're the leader. You know, I think uh, Sam referred to it as uh, 
what was it? Uh, challenge? Something in challenge, he calls it, uh, is his philosophy behind it. I can't remember the other term, but uh, you, you want to make sure that those boys have that experience of playing up and playing down as well. So anything you can do to change the environment, the learning context is going to be a benefit. And I think this is something that the Premier League do a really good job of. Dean Smith, who's in charge of the games programme, has introduced a whole host of different types of game formats, whether it be out of balance competition, whether it be leadership festivals, for example, which we've been involved in evaluating, um, to expose the kids to a broad range of challenges so they have the opportunity to explore and develop as many skills uh, as possible, I think is key. Um, just, just to add to the conversation as well, I think if you want to look at a really good example of great practice, and this was well in advance of any of the stuff that we were doing, uh, the work that Mandy Johnson was doing when she was working with Ferguson, our Sir Alex Ferguson, at uh, Manchester United, they were taking regular assessments of growth maturity and that informed a lot of their decisions relative to playing players up and playing players down. And they've got lots of examples of players who were classic late developers, who were physically small, who did play down. Uh, the uh, example of uh, Jesse Lingard is a really good one. He was even playing down two years. He was still a dot. He was a tiny wee lad. Uh, and I think Ferguson took him aside and said, look, you know, you are an incredibly talented player. Uh, we're playing you down at this current moment uh, because that is what is developmentally appropriate for you at this point of time. And it's because we actually believe in you. And it won't be 2021 until you can potentially play for our club. But we still believe that you can come through the process. And I think United, particularly Ferguson, have been really ahead of the game in terms of recognising these individual differences in growth and maturity and putting things in to play to to adapt for that. Um, so, uh, so it's been good fun to actually start to do some work with them as well. And I'm learning a lot from the process too. But yeah, Mandy, I think, was really at the forefront of that in terms of informing practice in that area. If you have any more questions, Graham, farm away. That's fine. Trust me, I'm I'm I like I like, I like listening. Um, but if that's all we've got on that, that's fine. We'll just move on to the last two questions and I'll let you go. Um interesting fact, I actually played four years above myself in rugby when I was I think it was like under nines or tens. I played like under fourteens. I'm at my club I played for, we had my age, my brother's age. And I was a big lad. I was I think I was like thirteen stone when I was in year seven. So I was a big boy. And I played like four years age up. Um as a prop as well. So it wasn't the best position, but there's like, you go in the back row, you'd be fine. Uh, but yeah, so it's an interesting. Uh, accidental buyer banding I did there four the, years. The study that came out on the uh, weight restricted divisions in New Zealand. In, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. It was an interesting one because uh, the, the big headliner from it was that the weight restricted divisions were a bad thing because those boys who were bigger, probably more mature, were uh, more likely to drop out. Uh, now, the guy who wrote the paper was an economist, and uh, his boy had been one of those big boys who'd been asked to play up and had not enjoyed the process. But if you actually look a lot closer at that data set and you look at the weight restricted divisions, which is where your later mature or smaller boys are going to be in, you actually see there's an increased retention within that group. And of course, that group is much greater than the boys playing up. So the boys playing up were only about 2% of the entire sample, whereas the boys in the weight restricted divisions were much greater. So if you look at the net benefit, of the overall weight restricted divisions in rugby there was a benefit in terms of retention it doesn't mean that we can't better support those boys playing up but actually the general principle seems to be of benefit in the long term for them that's one question is just what who would you like to see on the podcast and what sort of area and uh, would you like a round table area would you like to look at in the future so uh, graham you can go first if you have anyone in mind or um it's probably, again, the, the people that I tend to read most uh, the research around or have a bias towards. So I, I've done some research in reflection, for example, and Zoe Knowles is, is quite big on that area. So maybe someone like that. Um, again, Dave Collins, Jean Cote, Chris Cushion. You know, they're probably the people that I read most of the work. Um, so, yeah, someone like that um, would, would be good to listen to. That's great. And then Sean? Ooh, from an applied perspective, I always enjoy engaging with and listening to Des Ryan at Arsenal. I think he's very, very switched on. Uh, from a growth and maturity perspective, obviously people like Sam Scott, Ben Bradley, uh, Bournemouth, uh, James Parrott at Man United, I think are doing a lot to lead in terms of practice in this area. Uh, from an academic perspective, I, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I probably should do. I've probably got some uh, friends I could throw a bone at, but... Uh, uh, nobody jumps to mind at this current moment. Uh, Chris Tillerson. Chris Tillerson's doing some really good work up at Hull, uh, particularly around the subject of growth, maturity and biobanding. And I really like Chris's work. So I'd probably give a shout out to Chris on that one. That's great. Cheers. 
so thanks for you guys coming on. Uh, start with Graham. Where's the best place for me to find you? If you want people to find you, um, yeah. <laughs> probably my um, Twitter. Okay. So G underscore Mills eighty four, I think it is. Okay, that's great. And then Sean. I'm not on Twitter. Uh, I think I'd be fired if I was on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I'm on, on ResearchGate. So ResearchGate is kind of like, a, I guess it's a Facebook for academics to some extent. And I do have a project page there. So all of the work we do across uh, tennis, across ballet, across British gymnastics, uh, uh, the football stuff, anytime we do updates uh, on our work or we have new things or new resources, etc., we generally provide links to there to all of our papers or podcasts or videos, which we think are useful. So if you have an academic bent and you're interested in re reading a little bit more about that, then ResearchGate would be the place to go. That's great. And again, thanks guys for coming on. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and share with your friends. It means a lot to me and it can help out a great deal. Um, there will be new episodes coming up in the future, so please stay tuned.